Hello, everybody. Am I unmuted? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. All right, people are coming in. Um, and we are waiting for one of our other speakers. Uh, Penny is here. Penny is here. Okay, we've got 144 people in the room. I'm in a different place. I keep looking around for the clock. Okay, it's one o'clock. We can wait a few more minutes. Can I ask a question while we're waiting? Hi, everybody. Oh, everybody. of course. I can't <laughs> see you. Um, in terms of the slides that we want to share, since Carolina and I are not in the same place, it would probably be easiest if somebody else was sharing the slides for us. I don't know if Ava is here or if I should try to send it to Rico. I, I can do it, Penny. I was going to do it. Oh, you're going to share the slides? Yeah. Yeah, okay, I already great. tested it out and everything. So oh great, Carolina. Um, thanks. And by the way, I updated them, so make sure you refresh. If you yeah. um, are you on phone or camera? Should I be seeing you? And I spotlighted you. I think that's why you're not seeing oh, uh, oh, oh yep. okay. But yep. I see people on the top. Okay. Sure. Here, let me I will spotlight Carolina and Penny right oh, now. Oh, I see. Uh it's okay. One second. Okay, there's Carolina. Let me go find Penny. I'm right here. Yes. Oh, there she is. Yep. Okay. There we go. Okay. Hi, Penny. Hi, Penny. Hi, Anne. Hi. This is a good program to have on May Day, I think. I know I should have worn a red shirt. I don't know why I reached. Oh, are we supposed to wear red? Well, we always wear red now. Always wear right? red. Whatever it is, red is the PSC. I just wore so much red this weekend. Lots of red. Okay. That's all right. I wished our president uh, a happy May Day at our labor management meeting this morning. <laughs> <laughs> did, who, who did he or she know what you were talking about? She did. She did. Okay, I think that uh, we can call the meeting to order. Uh, welcome everybody to our May 1st, 2023 chapter meeting. Uh, we just saw each other last week and I know we like together, like we like to and need to get together pretty often as we um, wait ourselves through the medical morass that we're in. But anyway, today we're going to take a, a little walk around New York City, but a different kind of a walk, um, a people's walk. And we're gonna hear from uh, two of our well-known, I would say very well-known uh, activists and PSC leaders, Penny Lewis and Carolina. Penny, or Penny Lewis teaches at the School of Labor and Urban Studies, and she's currently the secretary of the PSC. She is the author of Hard Hats, Hippies and Hawks, the Vietnam anti-war movement as myth and memory. And she's co-editor of the books, The City is the Factory and Immigration Matters. Penny is a third generation New Yorker and her co-authorship of A People's Guide to New York City feels highly over-determined. 
Carolina Bank Munoz is in the sociology department at Brooklyn College and also at the Graduate Center. And she is the chapter chair of the PSC chapter at Brooklyn College. She is the author of Transnational Tortillas, Gender and Shop Floor Politics in the US and Mexico, which won the Terry Book Award. Also Building Power from Below, Chilean Workers Take on Walmart, and the co-author of Walmart in the Global South. And now, of course, she's the co-author of uh, A People's Guide to New York City. She's also active in the Immigrant Student Success Office at Brooklyn College. Um, and there's a third author to this book, Emily Thompson Molina, another co-author, but she's not here with us today. So what, are, what is this book about? Let me see what we wrote, and then you, can, then you can take us on the walk. A People's Guide to New York City expands the scope and scale of traditional guidebooks, providing an equitable exploration of the diverse communities throughout the city. Through the stories of over 150 sites across all the boroughs, as well as thematic tours and contemporary and contemporary and archival photographs, a people's guide emerges. Uh, uh, the, peop, the, the people's New York, sorry, emerges as one in which collective struggles for justice and freedom have shaped the very landscape of the city. And uh, I think it's very appropriate. Happy May Day, everybody. Cecilia will be taking some notes and ready to go. I think Carolina is gonna start. Thanks, Anne. Um, and thank you to the retiree chapter for inviting us and having us. Um, many of you know this history better than we do. So we're really looking forward to the, to the conversation. I'm going to share my screen um, so that you can see the slideshow. Just pull it up. Hmm. Okay, we're patient. We we're tried ready. this. We tried this ahead of time, but it's given sure. trouble now. We're patient. We're patient. There we go. Can you all see that yet, or no? Uh, not yet, no. Carolina. Do you All think right. it's because we're spotlighted? Maybe if we're not no, spotlighted? It's, it's because I know what I did. I started the PowerPoint. Um, I mean, I figured it out. Okay. It should work in just a second. I'm, I'm having, Bonnie, are you able to read the chat? Because I'm having trouble. All yes. right. Folks see that? Yes. Yes. We can see that. Great. I'm going to make it a little bigger, but. Glad show. Great, great. great. Okay, that's the okay. Cover. Yay, we figured out the technology. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, again, thank you. Um, 10 years ago, I went to hear Laura Pulido talk about a people's guide to LA at the Romans bookstore in Pasadena, California. And I was absolutely enthralled by the concept of a guidebook as an intellectual project, as well as an alternative to existing guidebooks that focus on glitz and glamor, consumption and spectacle, uh, often at the expense of the lived experiences of people of color, immigrants, working class people, indigenous people, and LGBTQ communities. In Laura's presentation, I learned new things about LA, about my history and my community, Growing up in LA, I was always uncomfortable with the LA that was being crafted by people who came to visit me. People would say, you are must be so lucky to live in a city that's so full of famous people. <laughs> that's at the center of the film industry. That's rich and beautiful. 
um, I would hear. Well, internally, I was always thinking that's not my LA. My LA is immigrant working class and struggles to get by. My LA is the justice for janitors movement and the big day, May Day marches. Loda's presentation spoke to me because she was describing my experience and the experience of so many like me. At the time of uh, her presentation of the LA guide, I had already been in New York City for eight years. And similar to my experience in LA, I was growing tired of family and friends visiting New York and saying, wow, you live in, you're so lucky to live in a majestic city with so much culture and museums and attractions. Uh, yet my New York City was a falling infrastructure at CUNY, gentrification, the fight against the Barclay Center, Occupy Wall Street, and our union's contract fight. So I kept thinking, you know, most many of my students don't even have access to the things that attract people to New York City. Um, and I felt people didn't really understand the real, you know, the quote unquote real New York. Uh, and that nagging feeling led me to ask Wendy Chang, who is one of the co-authors of the People's Guide to LA, is there a plan for a People's Guide to New York City? And she said, no. Little did I know then that the next 10 years of my life would be consumed with this project. Um, I foolishly said, how hard could it be? to write a people's guide to New York City. <laughs> and it took me 10 years to find out. Um, so upon returning to New York City, I started thinking about who would embark on this ludicrous idea with me. And uh, Honey shared such enthusiasm uh, for the project that I immediately asked her to join me in writing it. And since both of us are strongly focused uh, in labor, we knew that we really wanted someone with a, an urban focus and a geography lens, and that was Emily. Um, so why a people's guide? From the guide's description, it's a different kind of guidebook, one that explains power relations in a way that everyone can understand and which shares stories of struggle and resistance that inspire and educate activists students and critical thinkers. As the series editors argue, the books in the series are about creating deliberate political disruption. By making visible the invisible social dynamics that undergird the city, we hope to shift how you determine what and who are important to New York City. It's not just about what to do and what to see, but rather what to know and how to peel through the layers of history. Reconceptualizing a guidebook in this way not only democratizes knowledge, but it allows ordinary citizens to make claims on our right to the city. Learning from history and contemporary struggles facilitates bolder demands for the kind of city we want to live in, a city with affordable housing, free public higher education, better transportation, more parks, a cleaner environment, better wages and working conditions, healthcare for all, <laughs> um, and, and among many other things. So before turning it over to Penny, I just wanted to say that this project has been a labor of love for the three of us, and it wouldn't have been possible without our advisory board, the participation of students and community members and organizations. Um, Scott Dexter and Stephanie Luce uh, were our main photographers and the many New York City institutions who gave us access to photos and archival materials, it really took a village. Thank um, you. Thanks, Carolina. And again, hi, everybody. And thank you all for having us here. Um, I'm going to talk through uh, the, the theoretical and political interventions we think the book has made, and then <clears throat> just quickly run us through you know, point to some of the places that we go. Um, so Carolina, we're gonna like stay on this slide probably for a little while. Um, so uh, Carolina said that the, that the LA guide had talked about these guidebooks having a deliberate political disruption. Um, and, you know, what does that look like in New York? Um, so first of all, uh, we pay attention to the actual struggles that have made the city 
um, along vectors of class, race, gender, sexuality, religion, ethnicity, immigration status, access to healthcare, education, housing, transportation, information, culture, and more. So, it, you know, if you read across all of the sites in this book, um, you know, you will see like story after story of ways in which people have made the city. Um, uh, and, you know, this goes from the colonial era and fights against slavery up through Black Lives Matter and labor organizing at Amazon. Um, we also approach this in a way that's very different than a lot of other uh, guidebooks in that we very purposely tried to decenter the city. Um, I'm, everybody here is a New Yorker at this point, either born or or here for a super long time. And, you know, we all talk about like, I live in Brooklyn, I'm going into the city this weekend, right? I mean, we, we refer to the Manhattan, Manhattan as the city. Uh, our guidebook, um, you know, there are more sites that are located in Manhattan than any other borough, but altogether Manhattan gets about a third of the book. Most of our sites are so-called outer borough, um, as are the bulk of the thematic tours that we end with. Um, and the way that we broke up the book is by borough, starting in the north with the Bronx, Montefiore Hospital, and 1199's organizing. And we go to Manhattan, um, to Queens, Brooklyn, and ending 134 sites later at Staten Island and the Lenape Burial Ridge at Conference House Conference House Park, which is actually the southernmost part of New York State. <laughs> um, so that is the kind of scope of the book. Um, the other thing that we, you know, the intervention that we make is to tell the stories in the book, um, understanding a number of dynamic tensions that we think shape and reshape the social organization of New York City, and also, you know, the streetscape, you know, what we see when we walk around or take the train. Um, and these tensions are not necessarily unique to New York. I mean, there are tensions that exist in many urban spaces, but we'd argue that they are uh, more pronounced and determinative in our city than in many other places. Um, one is between uh, public goods and private wealth. Uh, you know, the incredible concentration that we have in New York City, um, highest number of billionaires, you know, uh, richest counties, et cetera, in the country. Um, uh, but we also have arguably among the most developed, if underfunded, as we all know directly, public infrastructures in the country. Um, we are also the most union dense, state and city. Um, and we have all kinds of public entitlements in New York. I mean, a robust, again, if underfunded public hospital system, um, a right to shelter, you know, things that other, uh, other municipalities in the country, you know, do not typically have. So this tension between public and private um, power and wealth, you know, is, is pretty acute in New York. Um, we also, uh, uh, contrast and our colleague Josh Freeman, you know, um, pointed out the uh, extreme cosmopolitanism of New York and <laughs> um, the extraordinary diversity of drawing people together from all over the world, um, you know, as a as a, sh a center of shipping and um, uh, you know people here by force and people here by choice from all over the world. Uh, and the extraordinary tolerance and, um, uh, you know, everybody is, is uh, you know, gets to know your neighbor, you're thrown in together, all the things about New York that make it a, a very cosmopolitan city. Um, we contrast that with the uh, kind of provincial clannishness that also exists throughout New York um, and the uh, you know, racial tensions that exist in New York, the inter-ethnic tensions um, that exist, you know, sometimes neighborhood within neighborhoods, uh, community to community, um, and ways in which people, you know, can be very, uh, uh, very much inside of the particular places in New York, as opposed to um, identifying with a kind of cosmopolitan and how people, individuals track back and forth but the city displays both of those 
um, characteristics uh, pretty extremely. Um, uh, similarly, this tension between the kind of freedom of New York as a place where new things are tried, protest movements are born, um, you know, extraordinary uh, uh, art and culture, um, amazing movements in, in both politics and culture that have come up out of New York and, and the kind of freedom to live here as you want to be. Um, but combined with uh, a pretty extraordinary amount of, of state repression apparatus that exists in New York. We have the biggest police force um, in the country per capita of a major city by far. Um, we have, you know, uh, uh, hostile architecture that doesn't allow people to, you know, sit on benches. Um, you know, the the prison structure, the surveillance, um, the you know, stop and frisk, which was finally ended. We all are familiar with it. So we contrast the kind of freedoms and repression that we navigate as New Yorkers. Um, so those are some of the dynamic tensions that we touch upon across our sites. Um, and then I'll just say that our, our sites also pay attention to um, uh, two things that you wouldn't normally see in a guidebook. Um, first of all, we do tell the stories of pretty famous places, but we often tell them through alternative stories. Um, and I will get to that in a second, an example of that. And we also pay attention to things that that don't actually exist anymore. <laughs> and we tell stories of sites that are not there. Um, because often, you know, when you walk down a street and the history has been erased, you know, that that erasure itself is a really important point in terms of um, telling the history and the story of a people's New York. Because um, things are erased for reasons of victory and things are erased for reasons of defeat from the perspective of people's struggles. Anyway, so now, Carolina, maybe we can just go through, and I'm, I'm not going to speak at length, but just to point at some of the uh, sites that we have and, you know, how they fit into these themes. We, uh, we talk about Ostos um, and the founding of Ostos uh, and the Save Ostos Committee, um, you know, that was very active in the 70s when New York City wanted to actually close Ostos within five uh, months, uh, five uh -huh. years of starting it. Um, we also have City College. Uh, Carolina, you can go to the next one. Um, uh, the Seventh uh, Regiment Armory. Um, it, and just to say like Ostos talks about obviously public goods and struggles and, um, and you know, and movements. Uh, the Seventh Regiment Arm Armory allows us to talk about this is also the Park Avenue Armory right next to Hunter College. Um, the, you know, the role that extreme wealth has played in New York, uh, it got its massive influx of funding um, right after the railroad strikes and the um, 1877, I think, do I have this right? I think it was the 1877 major strikes that also happened in New York. Um, you know, suddenly the very wealthy people who had been moving to the Upper East Side invested incredible amounts of money to make this the, the most opulent of the armories to hold the National Guard who were placed strategically around the city so as to be positioned to put down things like labor unrest. Um, so we tell the story of the 7th Regiment Armory. Um, you can go to the next. Uh, talking about public spaces and also the freedoms offered by New York. We look at the People's Beach in um, Rockaway. Uh, this is one of the early uh, LGBT, um, LGBTQ plus um, uh, public sites claimed by the LGBTQ plus communities um, in New York and uh, a site of, of uh, like both freedom, you know, to be gay in, you know, out in New York, but also of organizing and um, public uh, pressure from the community during many of the crises faced by the queer communities of New York. Um, Crown Heights riots of 1991, another site, um, you know, which both points to the the inter-ethnic um, and, and racial conflicts in the city writ large, 
um, but between uh, the Hasidic community and the Afro-Caribbean, African-American communities of Crown Heights um, and the political, you know, uh, failures um, of the city, you know, during that period and, you know, efforts um, made to, to kind of, uh, bridge the issues raised in that, you know, in the fights and the riots of, of 1991, decades later, you know, uh, ways in which, you know, Hasidic community members supporting um, the Black Lives Matter protests in the neighborhood. So trying to kind of tell a longer arc to the story of Crown Heights in that entry. Um, our next one, uh, the Wigwam Club, this is a vanished site because if you look at the picture, that is clearly not the Wigwam Club, but the Wigwam Club used to be um, located in, um, in uh, uh, Burham Hill, like downtown Brooklyn. And we actually tell this story um, as a kind of alternative story because we get there by talking about the Empire State Building. Um, the, uh, there were Native Canadians, actually, um, the Kanawake uh, tribe, I don't know if I'm saying that name um, correctly right now, but uh, uh, Native Canadians, Mohawk uh, uh, Canadians who came to the United States and helped build the Empire State Building had a very, very large community in what is now Burham Hill um, and used to be called North, North Brooklyn. Um, and the area around Gowanus. And there was a bar on Nevins called the Wigwam Club that was frequented by the Mohawk iron workers who helped build Empire State Building, Rockefeller Center, et cetera. Um, so this is a vanished site that helps us tell a, you know, a story um, of the Empire State Building, but really who built it and what is the story behind the Empire State Building. Um, and then finally, I think this is the last site um, oh no, here's, this is another uh, vanished site, um, the Storefront Museum, um, a fantastic enterprise started among others by a man named Tom Lloyd, trying to set up a, a, a museum that would be open to the community, an Afrocentric uh, uh, museum in the 1970s. And it came out of a push within the art community um, to uh, broaden and I diversify all of the institutions of culture in New York City. And um, it was called the Art Workers Collective um, that did protests at places like MoMA, you know, demanding that there be, um, you know, wings, um, you know, devoted specifically to Black art, Latino art, um, immigrant art, uh, trying to make sure that, that the cultural institutions of New York were diverse. And the Storefront Museum was an actual instantiation of what that could look like. Um, and then I think this might now be the final one. Um, another vanished site, uh, the New York Organic Fertilizer Committee in the Bronx, I'm, I'm sorry, company in the Bronx, which was a noxious, horrific industry um, that was in Hunts Point where there's a ton of you know, toxic uh, environmental, environmental uh, you know, disastrous, um, uh, industries over the 20th century into the 21st, and community pressure finally closed this um, smelly and, and awful uh, fertilizer company. Um, so this, this is just a kind of quick tour of the kinds of sites that we have that make the kinds of interventions that we are interested in making in the book. And I will give it back to Carolina for the end. Yeah, and just to say, you know, the East New York farm site is an example of like a contemporary site, right? They're not all historical sites. We tried to strike a balance between the alternative stories, historical sites, contemporary sites, um, all of these kind of different ways of thinking about uh, the city. So as we were deciding, you know, how to, how to, pick these sites and think about these sites. We also noticed that we didn't, we, we needed kind of thematic or geographic essays uh, because we didn't want to forget about things like that, that um, kind of shape the natural and built environments that connect and distinguish the city but aren't necessarily sites. So things like water and public transit and islands and, um, so for example, 
the essay on islands that Penny wrote, you know, talks about how the fractured geography um, allowed the city to make strategic use of the islands and locate marginal, uh, marginal and marginalized peoples and processes to those islands, right? The islands weren't isolated, were isolated just enough, but also close enough to the city to hide them in plain sight. So jails and mental hospitals and homeless shelters and quarantines and workhouses and dumps and graves and the like, you know, shape the story of the islands that are part of the city. Um, Hart Island off the Bronx, for example, is the largest common grave in the US. Uh, Roosevelt Island, which used to be Blackwell's Island, played host to a prison, mental institution, smallpox hospital before gentrifying in recent years. So we hope that these essays are kind of an additional historical uh, and geographic backdrop um, for a deeper understanding of sites. Um, and we also include thematic tours that knit together standalone sites with additional places using different thematic lenses. So for example, the seven train tour through Queens that illustrates waves of my immigration to New York City, a Wall Street tour that some of you will be going on on Friday um, that focuses on protests and environmental justice tour of Brooklyn and Queens, uh, which is just like another way of experiencing um, a people's New York. Uh, and then finally, how did we make these decisions? <laughs> um, how did we decide which sites specifically? Uh, and it was a delicate and imperfect balance of a lot of things, a lot of uh, a lot of arguments, a lot of lists. <laughs> um, we first started out with our advisory board. Um, uh, we wanted to to uh, bring together an advisory board of. Uh, academics and activists and movement organizers who would share what they think are the most kind of important sites in the city. Um, so we chose sites whose stories can be seen as kind of emblematic of the social forces that we wanted to, to highlight. Um, and our advisory board helped us identify these social forces and the best locations and stories. For them. So um, lots of CUNY folks were part of this advisory uh, committee. Um, what time lunch on Thursday? And, and then from there, we also tried. Oh, okay, it doesn't wanna, matter like, to you. Excuse me. Stories? Yeah, go ahead. No, somebody needs to be muted. Go ahead, Carolina. Um, so we also didn't want to repeat stories. There's a million environmental justice stories in New York City. We didn't tell them all, right? We had to make kind of strategic choices about where to locate stories. And, um, and that had to do with what those, where, where stories were had to do with clustering also. Like we didn't want to send people. So a good example of this is like, um, the Malcolm X house in Queens, it takes like a subway and a bus to get to, it's a private residence. Like we didn't wanna locate the Malcolm X story there. Uh, so, and we also didn't wanna locate the Malcolm X story at Audubon because that's kind of the most, you know, one of the most known stories. So we located the Malcolm X story at the 28th precinct, right? So choices like that, um, trying to uh, privilege outer boroughs over Manhattan, um, trying to be respectful of people's private residences and organizations. Like we didn't want, uh, we also didn't want to like highlight tons of community organizations because we didn't want to send droves of people uh, to kind of be interrupting the work of these organizations, right? Um, and finally, like I said, clusters were really important for long public transit journeys wherever possible uh, so that when we're sending people to specific places, they're not just going to see one thing, they're going to see a cluster of things in the same area, right? And we tried to, um, in, in places where we knew there were like long-standing like restaurants, 
that uh, were kind of deeply rooted in the community. We added, you know, kind of both sites of near nearby sites of interest and also kind of places to eat um, that had kind of a long trajectory. So that was kind of our decision making process. And thank you very much. We're love to hear from you and um, any feedback and questions and yeah. Oh, we'll open it up, so I'll stop sharing. Okay. Thank you so much. Really fascinating. Really fascinating. The process and the product and the stories, how you made your decisions, and always with help of other people, right? Always collaborative. And, uh, you know, that's that's the way researchers like you work. I, I, as I said at the beginning, uh, I gave, I was looking for my copy because as soon as I heard about it, I, I bought it and I couldn't find my copy. And finally I realized I gave it to somebody from out of the country actually who came uh, to visit. And I guess I never got it back and I never followed up either to find out wh where they were. I hope they went to some of these places. <laughs> anyway, so we have some time for, uh, Questions. I don't know if Penny, uh, you want to, or Diane, uh, you want to just say something very quickly about the tour for Friday, and then we can go to uh, Q and A. Well, sure. I mean, right now, I think we um, we're. I'm doing a tour at ten o'clock in the morning, uh, the capitalism and protest tour. Um, and I think we have like 10 folks signed up and it probably shouldn't be much more than 10, but we can have a waiting list. And if there are a lot of folks who are interested, I'm absolutely game to do it again. So if folks are interested, um, maybe Diane can, you know, uh, I don't know if there's a link to sign up, but wherever the link is to sign up, um, you can do that. And then we, we can, can put the link in the chat. We have uh, 12 so far, you wanted 10. So we're gonna have maybe a waiting list already. And, I mean, uh, I think we can do 12. It's just about the volume of my yelling. <laughs> <laughs> the volume of your yelling. Well, Penny, you are very experienced at speaking yelling? <laughs> uh, loudly, clearly, and beautifully. Um, and thank you so much for offering to do that. Um, I know you're, you're, you're very, very busy. Okay, so for some reason, I this screen is set up differently than I I usually see people. Uh, is it? Is maybe we could unspotlight us so we can see yeah, the whole. Yeah, and unspotlight me too. Uh, Ava, is Ava here or? Okay, yeah, because this is the way I like to to call on people. All right, so. Uh, uh, Let's try to uh, keep questions, uh, comments to, to 90 minutes, please. I see Lydia Gerson. Lydia asked to unmute. You have, okay. Hey, hi. Uh, just quickly, I was just wondering, um, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble with my camera, but I was just wondering if, uh, who did you interview? Uh, did you interview anybody in, in in New York City um, about perhaps any memories they might have had of what the neighborhood was like? That's a great question, Lydia. We didn't we didn't do interviews uh, or at least not very many formal interviews. We did send out some students to talk to people, but um, that is one of the things that we didn't do that was uh, the People's Guide to LA had some kind of uh, short biographies that they uh, kind of highlighted, and and we we did not do that in part. I think uh, because of just the enormous amount of like time <laughs> uh, and work, but also because we had some of those folks in our advisory committee, and and we're kind of getting getting a lot of the details that we would have that we might have gotten from interviews through the advisory committee. I don't know Penny if you want to add to that. Well, I'd also say that unlike the LA guide, we also we a number of the entries like Carolina, Emily and I wrote the vast bulk of the book, but we have you know between 30 and 40, I don't remember the exact number in my mouth, 
um, entries that were written by other people. And so, you know, some of the entries are more like first person, like Coney Island, Moses Gates, like, you know, writes about it very much as, you know, somebody who's, you know, brings in a lot of voices. Um, and so a number of the entries reflect a kind of interview process that, you know, took place on the part of the person writing it. Thank you. Before I continue, am I the only one hearing a, a sound like a doorbell ringing every time? Some oh, okay. I uh, it, I don't know if it's Ava or Rico. Is that when you're admitting people? Because I only invited five people to my party, and I'm not answering the door uh, after five. <laughs> yeah, I'm. Uh, that's it's happening when I let people in, but I'm not sure why the noise has started all of a sudden. It wasn't doing that earlier. I will try to investigate. Okay, we'll we'll do our best. Nancy Romer. Okay, sorry, um, I was having unmuting problems. It's such a great book, and and of course the presentation was fantastic. It it's so um, it just feels like our New York. So again, thank you. I immediately as soon as it came out, I bought three copies and gave two away to people who I knew would love it. Um, I'm curious as to how much you you w went to the sites. I mean, how did you manage that, and did you eat at all the restaurants? <laughs> <laughs> um I, well i'll start with this one we um we 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 went to uh well i think actually we probably did go to basically all the sites um in order to both uh get a sense of the kind of clustering because we really did want to make it so that if we send you someplace like that you know, there might be other sites nearby so we wanted to get a sense of like the walkability you know of the clustered sites, um, but uh, but also precisely to be able to like enter right into the sites, a sense of what the the streetscape was like, right? So we, what it, what the neighborhood feels like there. Um, but there were some, I mean, more memorable trips than others. Like going to Staten Island was uh, listen to us. It's like we went to the exotic borough of Staten Island, um, but you know that was a really fun trip, um, I would say for the, you know, where we, and we, we ate in some great places and drove around um, Staten Island. That's together. <laughs> that was preparing you for 24 seven work at the PSC, right? <laughs> oh yeah. The 10 yeah. years of work. <laughs> okay, thanks Nancy. Alan Fagenberg, you have to unmute yourself. I'm I'm pressing I'm pressing S to unmute, uh, but nothing's happening. Oh, can somebody help? How about Alan? We'll come back. Oh, there, there you, you go. go. Now I am. Okay, Thank you. Um, so, so to start, this is our, our two colleagues that did this. Thank you so much. And I'll talk about this generally, but very personally, because all of you, my history and profession has been an architect in New York City. And one of the things they've done is we've had architects write books about New York City. And they've been called, called the AIA of New York City. And they're very complete in talking about individual buildings, what they're considered as the good buildings. And what the two of you are raising, which I think is so critical and so important, is this interaction of people in their environment and showing the buildings and the architecture are what are, are helping people, what people are creating. And so I think this is a wonderful but important thing because enough of this doesn't get done. We have all this other kind of uh, creative academic stuff. And this is an important thing. And personally, thank you so much. And I, think uh, oh, I intend to read it. 
Yeah, and and I think if I remember correctly, Alan, you have done your own walking tours in the City College area in, yeah. the, in the past. I've taken them as students. I've also taken some of our retirees. Right. And it's been right. a little more limited because we, they can't kind of walk as far and as long a distance. Really? But we looked at buildings and discussed the neighborhood. <laughs> okay, well, we are retired. Henry Lesnick. Thank you, Alan. Thank Henry, you. Henry Lesnick. Can we unmute? I'm, I'm, okay. I'm sorry. I wanted to raise my hand for the uh, following portion of the meeting, not to discuss this. So excuse me. I'll lower my hand for now. Okay. 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 Sorry. Okay. I appreciated the talk by the colleagues, though, very much and find the book very interesting, and we'll look at it, for sure. Thank you. Okay, Henry. Thank you. Um, I don't see any more hands, and I do not think that's because people don't have interesting things. Ah, there's a hand. Bruce McIntyre. Unmute, please. I don't know why. Bruce, can you unmute? Um, Rico, it is something. Uh, I just unmuted Bruce. Okay, you sh you have been unmuted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank okay. you. One thing I missed in your discussion, wonderful discussions of your great sounding book was the uh, mention of religion. I assume religion made, pay, plays a big part in developing a community in communities. Would you agree with Walt Whitman that, that Brooklyn is still the borough of churches? <laughs> hey, Bruce, nice to see you. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we we treaded lightly on religion. I would say that religion does uh, definitely come into the book. Um, I do think Brooklyn is still the borough of churches, uh, although changing in, in their appearance, many storefront churches, right, versus these large cathedrals. And I mean, we still have those too, but I think immigration um, and other dynamics have shaped that too, right? Um, so yeah, so religion is not, it's in the book, but it, I wouldn't say it's a central organizing uh, feature of the book. We have like, a, we there are a couple of the sites we have is like the Ganesh Temple um, in Jackson Heights and uh, the, is it in Jackson Heights? Um, uh, and, the Quaker Remonstrance, Flushing. Flushing. Um, maybe they're both in Flushing. Um, and I am speaking, mm -hmm. being two, two years away from the book, not having the map fully inside of my head anymore. Um, uh, and I would, and you know, religious, I mean, religion is in there also like the St. Vincent's Hospital. Like we talk about the role of like the Catholic hospitals. Um, and, you know, so I, but, but Carolina is right that it's not to the forefront, but it is very much in the background in a lot of entries because it is, you know, the source of community um, and so many of the communities that we that we cover. Thank you. Well, I am sure there would be more questions or comments if people weren't anxiously waiting to go to our second part of the meeting, which is to discuss health care. That's been a very popular topic. And um, so I wanna thank both of you very, very much. It's a fabulous book uh, and a, a fabulous talk. And thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to come and talk with us. And uh, I hope we hear some feedback. People who are going on the tour with Penny, it would be really nice if we had an article for our Turning the Page 
a newsletter written by somebody or uh, a group of you who are, are going on the tour. And I, and I think, I don't know, I mean, maybe c people can brush up and we can lead some of our own tours uh, in, different, in different places. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, so thank you much. everybody. Okay, bye. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Well, uh, I know healthcare is next because we have over 300 people in the room. Um, now, I, I can you wait just one second, Robert Cowan, while we make a transition? I, I need to see who is in the room, our experts, Debbie Bell, is unable to be here today. You've had a, heard a lot from Debbie, but we're supposed to have other people and we can't start this part of the meeting until I know that they are here. So um, one of them is Dean. Is I'm Dean here. Yeah, I'm here. Dean is here. Um, is Barbara Caress here? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Is uh, Donna Costa and or Michael Foley here? Okay. Um, Bettina, I think I saw Bettina. I think Dean, that's that's the roster for today. Am I right? Yes. Okay. So um, Dean is going to talk first. Uh, focusing on the broader context, I think the political struggle and and where we are, and then we'll go from there. Please, if you have questions, it's best if you raise your hand. If you put the questions in the chat, eventually somebody will mine them, but we have to be looking at the chat. Oh, and okay, go ahead, Dean, sorry. Hey, happy May Day, everybody, the international workers holiday that started here, but ironically is not recognized here officially as a holiday. But anyway, it is. It's the workers holiday today. Yay. Um, so I think I want to start in the same place that Debbie started at the last meeting, which is um, bringing everybody's attention to the web page, um, the retiree healthcare web page that has a great deal of information actually about um, the transition that's happening and um, it just information that folks need. So I'm going to share my screen um, and ask whether people can see that. Can I? Yep, we see it. Guys? Okay, cool. So the easiest way to get to this, um, it, there's lots of ways to get to it, but I just Google PSC CUNY retiree healthcare, and it's the first thing that comes up. Um, so this is the page that has all the latest information that we have that uh, Bill Friedheim does a great job of getting it up there as soon as we know it. Um, so the first little section is the basic announcement about the decision that the city made with the cooperation of the MLC um, to make this Aetna Medicare Advantage PPO the default as of September 1. Um, the second link is really, I think, the most critical uh, information. Um, it uh, gives you quite a few details about like what is happening and what you need to know. Um, so, you know, the section one has the, the details of, but, about what's happening and, um, you know, the, some of the specific information about um, the impacts um, on, uh, People, what the uh, you know the fact the fact for the, the folks who um, don't opt out or waive the Aetna Medicare Advantage PPO that you will be con continue to be covered by the welfare plan. Um, that senior care is going to be going away. Um, then, in terms of alternatives, you see the section here that talks about either, the option to either opt out. The opt-out period is May 1, so it starts today uh, through June 30th. 
we are urging everybody, if you scroll down here, don't rush to opt out or to waive New York City coverage. Waiving New York City coverage would be what you do if you wanna keep traditional Medicare and then purchase a Medigap plan. Um, the reason we're asking people not to rush, but to really wait um, is one, it gives you the chance to really study the uh, various options and cost implications. Um, and um, things change, as we know from the first round, going through the whole debacle with the so-called alliance. Um, you know, the retirees are promising a lawsuit. Um, we are currently negotiating with CUNY to try to protect welfare fund benefits for people who decide to waive um, New York City coverage. So those factors we think all militate in favor of waiting and not rushing into your decision about whether to opt out or to waive New York City coverage. Again, you have until right now till June 30th to make through that make to make that decision. Um, here's sort of a guide of um, how to think through those options, the um, uh, the various kinds of materials that you can study, the the Aetna website, uh, where to find things on the Aetna website. Here's information about what it would cost you if you decide to waive New York City healthcare coverage um, and where to find your own Medigap plan, um, how to do the pricing, um, what would happen to dependents. Um, and uh, then this fourth section is about your right to basically to change your mind. Um, and uh, there is the, you know, the annual, it's now an annual open enrollment period in November that still exists. Um, you also, everybody has a once in a lifetime right to change plans outside the open enrollment period. And then there are still these, you know, the qualifying events under the law that allow you to change benefits such as a divorce or the death of a spouse. Um, so I think that is a particularly um, helpful uh, page. Um, but uh, then uh, this other uh, link on that page is got all the important contact information um, for the Office of Labor Relations, um, the Aetna evidence of coverage document, which spells out all the plan rules, um, Aetna's FAQs, uh, information about Aetna's information sessions, how to get more information about uh, Medigap plans um, and options. The Medicare Rights Center is a particularly great resource um, uh, for folks that speak, seeking specific information about Medicare and, and Medigap. Um, and then here's information about continuity of care. Um, so again, you know, just like Debbie said last week, really um, that page on the PSC website is where to go for the most up-to-date information that we have certainly um, about what's happening. Um, there's a couple other things I wanna go over with you um, real quickly, hang on one second. Um, um, we are putting together FAQs um, that are based on uh, answers to, largely to answers to questions folks raised at the Aetna meeting. Um, we will be posting those on the retiree healthcare page. Um, we also are going to be putting together a, a, an online uh, form uh, as a way to collect the um, people's experiences uh, so that we can keep track of problems that are happening, especially um, problems that seem to be happening over and over. Um, and so we can direct our advocacy um, uh, to the correct issues and to the correct places. Um, I wanted to briefly mention the continuity of care issue and um, uh, Barbara Caress may be able to follow up on this, but um, there is language in the contract between Aetna uh, and the city, which 
provides that Aetna will not be doing um, any automatic denials of in-network claims based on lack of uh, prior authorization for the first 120 days. So from September through December, essentially, um, in order to uh, make sure that people are, at least if they go in network, um, are not having any issues with respect to continuity of care. There is a proposed regulation that would require insurers providing Medicare Advantage coverage um, to provide um, continuity of care for um, people who are receiving treatment and move into a new Medicare Advantage plan for 90 days, whether that's in network or out of network. My understanding is that does not take effect until January, um, but that's also something to be aware of. Um, we also are aware of the issues folks have raised about TIAA. Um, and we have reached out to CUNY and to OLR and we'll be sitting down with them um, to discuss and work through those issues. Um, but really the, the primary issue that we are focusing right now in terms of advocacy um, is this issue of uh, making sure that we protect um, the welfare fund benefits of people who make the decision to waive New York City coverage. Um, we did meet with CUNY last week um, uh, without getting into all the details. CUNY took the position that they would temporarily commit to continue contributions to the welfare fund on behalf of people who waive city healthcare coverage, i.e. keep their traditional Medicare and pay for Medigap. Um, but they were insisting they wanted to keep the option open of ending those contributions. Uh, essentially, they were quite upfront about acknowledging they want to preserve the option to save money on the backs of retirees. And uh, James Davis objected to that very strongly. Um, uh, and uh, he was actually quite uh, incensed by that uh, position. Um, we are, James and I are working closely with Barbara Bowen and Steve London from the Welfare Fund, and we are uh, putting together a strategy to, to sort of try to leverage CUNY, CUNY to force them to keep contributing to the Welfare Fund, um, to protect the Welfare Fund benefits for folks who decide to waive city coverage. Um, but that's another reason that um, we are really urging everybody not to rush to make your decision about whether or not you uh, decide to waive city coverage because you know thing, a lot of things could change between now and June. Um, so um, there, you know, we are also continuing continuing the broader fight um, both against the you know forcing retirees into Medicare Advantage and around the privatization of healthcare in general, around the escalating costs, around the efforts to shift those costs uh, onto the backs of retired and in-service workers. Um, and really coalition building, especially with other unions, we think is critical to our ability to affect the kind of change that we need to make, whether it's legislative change or within the MLC uh, or pressuring the mayor or other, um, you know, government agencies. Um, we, you know, have been effective in building, uh, you know, I would call a small coalition. Um, and we need to just continue doing that work to strengthen uh, our relationships with, um, especially other unions that are doing this work. Um, and of course, with the uh, retiree organizations that are doing this work and with folks in the community who are just concerned about it. Because um, as uh, you know, we've noted in prior meetings, um, this is not just a retiree issue. It's an issue that's uh, gonna very quickly affect in-service workers as well. Um, so we are um, continuing to um, explore the possibility of um, advocating for a change to the administrative code that would explicitly require the city to 
pay for Medigap for people who decide to stay in city paid Medicare. Um, we have had a number of com conversations with allies on the council um, and they have told us across the board that um, there is no way that the council will even look at this until after the budget fight is over. Um, and so we are uh, hopeful about being able to raise and effectively advocate for a solution along those lines um, once the city budget is resolved. And I realize that timing is terrible for retirees, but that's um, the political reality that we're facing um, and that really our allies in the council are telling us across the board. Um, then uh, Barbara Caress and Debbie Bell uh, have been looking at various other advocacy options for us. Um, they uh, and Barbara we can talk more about them in a minute, but broadly they are looking at the possibility of, uh, you know, whether it would be possible for us to advocate to establish some kind of supplemental care program for seriously ill people for whom Aetna does not provide coverage. Um, we also want to advocate for more transparency in terms of the information about Aetna's performance under the contract. Um, and we would like to see the city much more aggressively monitoring and managing um, uh, Aetna and other companies that are providing healthcare to city workers. Um, and finally, uh, of course, you know, the really big ticket items are hospital prices um, and then ultimately single, single payer healthcare. And, you know, we have our eye on both those prices for the long term. Um, so that's uh, sort of it from me right now um, in terms of where we're at. And I maybe want to turn it over um, to Barbara Kress and then to Bettina for anything they have to add. Yes, and thank you so much, Dean. Uh, Dean is our executive director. He's the executive director of the whole PSE. And I think, Dean, probably your portfolio, which includes many, many things, at the top of that portfolio is really this healthcare issue. And uh, we really, really appreciate that work along with everybody else who's been contributing. Um, so Barbara Caress is our health care policy expert. Is Barbara? I'm here. Thanks, Anne. Yes, um, Barbara. You know, Dean did a great job, and I don't have anything to add. Maybe after we hear your questions, we'll have more to. I'm keeping notes on both the questions and the chat, and as um, Debbie will be back on Tuesday and we'll continue to add to the website in response to questions you guys raise here as well as questions you raise in the chat. And as soon as we have our reporting um, form up for you to tell us about problems that you're having, both getting at this point, getting information, getting answers from Edna or OLR. We'll incorporate that as well into the FAQs that we post as soon as we have answers. So I don't really have much to add, and but I'm here if I can to help answer Great. any questions. Great, thank you, Barbara. Thank you so much. Uh, did did uh, I hear that Bettina was here? Does Bettina want to say anything? I know she was planning to be here. Bettina, is there anything you'd like to add? Hi, can you hear me? Hi, yes. Bettina. Bettina is our legislative director. Right. I just, Dean said it all. I mean, one thing I would say to possibly supplement that is um, just don't forget about the mayor. Um, we do have allies in the city council. They are consumed by the city budget, which is something they can't control, which is due at the end of June. Um, but if you have extra energies of where you want to share your concerns, they should also be sent over to the mayor. So okay. we will uh, keep our relationships tight with council members over the city budget fight. Uh, they know that this is on the top of our agenda as soon as July rolls around. Yeah, that's a great point, Bettina. It really is the mayor who ultimately makes the decision about whether to uh, have the city continue to offer um, 
city paid Medigap coverage for folks who stay on traditional Medicare. So yeah, we are definitely encouraging folks to continue to put pressure on the mayor um, to restore that option, which the city has offered for decades. Okay, so uh, we'll go to questions. Let's try to keep those questions to a minute if you can, people. And I see, first, I see Ellen Goldner. Ellen, unmute. Uh, hi, just a really quick question. Um, if I decide to um, go into the Aetna Medicare Advantage plan, it says that um, we will be automatically enrolled if we don't opt out. Does that mean that we do not need to go to mymedicare.gov and change information about what we're signed up for? If we accept the Medicare Advantage plan by Aetna? Yeah, I can I can take this. Yes, absolutely. The city will it because it's what's called a, it has an employee waiver plan. It will enroll its two hundred and forty thousand people on mass. You don't have to enroll. And the process at CMS is Aetna sends the city sends the names to Aetna. Aetna sends the names to CMS. Once Aetna sends those names to CMS as of the effective date, which is September 1st, nobody needs to buy anything until September 1st, but um, Aetna will, uh, CMS will disenroll you from traditional Medicare and enroll you in uh, the Aetna plan or Thank the you very much. HIP Thank VIP you. plan, if that's Robert, the case. Robert, can, can you remind us what CMS is? CMS is the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services. It's the part of the federal government that runs Medicare. Thank you. Okay. Um, next, Eric Delson. Hi. I Eric. have a simple question, which is why does PSC feel so negatively about the Aetna package? I see nothing but we don't like it. It's a terrible thing. And yet I was finally able today to find the uh, grid comparing it with senior care and it seems to be comparable. So of those people who are activists I've against it, why? An answer to my question. Yeah, um, Eric, I would say that oh. um, uh, my impression and the impression of folks who understand the way insurance works is that the Aetna Medicare Advantage PPO is actually good as private healthcare goes. Um, and uh, I think the issue that folks have is with being forced um, out of traditional Medicare, which doesn't have prior authorization, which has broader networks um, into uh, private health insurance um, when, they're, when they're eligible and really entitled to this um, pu public health care benefit that folks fought for and won many, many decades ago. Um, but, it, you know, in terms of a private health insurance plan, the Aetna one, you know, seems to be pretty good as those things go, I would say. Thank you, Dean. I think I would like to say briefly that um, the, the two major issues that people have with Medicare Advantage plans in general are one, that not all doctors who take Medicare will take the Medicare Advantage plan. Um, this is a PPO and supposedly if your doctor takes Medicare, they'll pay them, but the doctor does not necessarily have to accept you as a patient if you're in this, in this uh, Medicare Advantage plan. The other problem that people have with Medicare Advantage plans is the one of pre-authorization. Um, they can and do um, turn people down for test procedures and things like um, stays in skilled nursing facilities. So that's that's of great concern. There's a um, Medicare, you know, more automatically allows people to have all of these um, procedures and tests and stays. According to their rules, you know, they're pretty generous with it, but um, with Medicare Advantage plans, they will um, look at the request for those things and turn people down if they feel that it's, not um, not cost effective, or if they just don't want to pay for it. And yeah, I, I I just one uh, two more cents, and then I think I mean this is a really important question, and I think 
maybe we really ought to address it directly on the website. But um, the fact is that Medicare Advantage, ha the Medicare Advantage companies get the same amount of money that Medicare would have spent approximately, but Medicare would have spent on you had you remained in traditional Medicare. The difference is, of course, that the Medicare Advantage companies um, have other priorities, including making a profit, as well as much more complex administration. So that if a thousand dollars of medic straight traditional Medicare spending produces, and it does about nine hundred and sixty dollars worth of health care, the same thousand dollars produces about nine hundred dollars worth of health care, or a little bit less, actually eight hundred and fifty dollars of health care through the Medicare Advantage plan. So it's the same dollars, it goes to different places. That said, by and large, Medicare Advantage works pretty well for 95% of the people 95% of the time. The problem is that we're all old and we're going to not always be in the 95% of people for whom it works 95% of the time. And then we really will want to be in the traditional Medicare, which is a um, a basically a much, much, much less fettered, or it's much more unfettered than Medicare Advantage. So, um, you know, I think we've been urging people to check it out for yourself. It's really important for you to see if your doctors are in the network, if your hospitals are in the network, because if they are, um, it probably will work pretty well. If they're not, that presents some significant problems. And, and as I said, I think we should address this question maybe with a little bit of an essay on in, in what you need to know. And I'll suggest that Debbie and I work on that for you. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, Bruce Brown, unmute, please. Yes, hi. So I have a couple of questions. We'll see how far we get. Uh, First one has one to minute. do with one minute. Okay, good. One minute, I'm timing it. Um, I have a question about pre-existing conditions, um, especially if uh, I decide to take Medicare Advantage, then decide that I don't like it, I wanna switch back to um, original Medicare. Uh, will a supplemental insurance company give me any hassles because I have pre-existing conditions, if that's the case, when I wanna jump back into original Medicare? Is that a big concern? It depends on where you live, unfortunately, because well, Medigap. Gonna, okay. If you live in, because Medigap is regulated. It's, it's the terms are set by the feds, by CMS, but it's regulated by the states. The states make their own rules about, for example, pre-existing conditions. In New York, if you live in New York, it's not an issue. If you okay. live in New Jersey, it is. Thank you for that good answer. I'm a New Yorker, so it would be okay for me. Um, going forward, I'm sure I and many other people will have questions specific to their own case. Is there somebody we can contact either in our union or a specialist that we may know of? I don't want to talk to Aetna about this. I'd rather talk. To, I mean, I could talk to them, too, but I want to talk to non-biased folks who would be uh, able to answer questions I might have. That is an excellent yeah. question. So um, we... Uh, are asking folks who have questions about Aetna coverage, benefits, anything having to do with Aetna to go to Aetna in the first instance because they are the ones right. providing this insurance. Mm -hmm. And if either they don't answer the question or you're getting inaccurate information, um, then we are going to want to know about it. Um, and so we are... Uh, planning to put a link to um, a, a Google form on the retiree healthcare page that folks can enter their whatever their question or their experience is, whether it's with Aetna or with OLR or about TIAA uh, or about something in the realm of you know uh, advocacy around political and policy change. Um, and then especially in terms of the problems with Aetna or with OLR, we're gonna be sort of keeping track of those and the ones, especially the ones that uh, are recurring and affecting a lot of people, we will essentially have a database uh, uh, of these experiences 
and be able to use that to advocate with Aetna, the city, the MLC to try to address these problems. Good, um, thank you. That's very helpful. I think that, was, that that answered my question. I just thank have one more point no, no, to make. Bruce, how about I'll come back to you after okay. I uh, if sure. go through the queue. Thank you. Uh, Barbara Becker, you have to unmute Barbara. Can you unmute Barbara? Message saying, okay, is this better? Yes, that's good. Okay, I got a message saying the host doesn't want me to unmute, so. Well, I'm the host and I, don't, I want you to. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, I called Emblem Health this morning just to get some background information. And I spoke to a very receptive uh, person and she said that they were getting many, many requests from city employees, not necessarily CUNY, in terms of their supplemental plan that they have, the supplemental gap plan. And she told me they have three plans, plan A, B, and C. And she thought that plan C was the most akin to our uh, senior health care. Um, I asked her for some information on it. She's uh, apparently sending me some. I haven't received that yet, but she said they've had so many requests. She is talking to her manager to see if they can set up a sales force and be there to answer questions. The Medigap program that she suggested to me was $272 a month, which she said was similar to what we have now, but it did not have the... Um, um, prescription drug coverage. So I'm wondering if the um, if you all were doing anything to talk with Emblem Health to see if we could navigate something with them uh, that would be somewhat more akin to what we have now, still being a supplemental program. But uh, okay, Barbara, could, could I take that? Yeah, yes, I'm, please do. One, I, I maybe would help to just explain how Medigap works. Um, Medigap has uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, about 10 variants. The terms of those variants are established by the federal government. They don't, if you buy a plan A in New York and a plan A in Mississippi and a plan A in California, they're all the same. What varies from state to state is what's charged, which is regulated by state insurance departments, or in the case of New York, the Department of Financial Services, and what other what else varies from state to state is the terms beyond your entitlement to buy that plan when you first become eligible. So in New York, for example, you could buy that plan at any time at uh, during the year. In New Jersey, you're limited. In California, you're limited. In Maryland, you're not. It depends on the state. So when an insurance company says we have exactly the plan that meets your needs, all they're telling you is that these are the terms that CMS has set, that the federal government has, the federal government dictates what's in plan A, what's in plan B. And what differs from A to B to C to F is the percentage of the gap that it covers. Does it cover the deductible? Does it cover the 20%? Does it have a... Um, uh, is it available internationally? There are a, a number of terms. Does it cover private duty nursing? So um, those are these are the the standardized plans. Um, I'm I'm glad that Empire wants to sell you one. I'm sure they want to sell hundreds. Um, just to say, um, because AARP sells its license to United Healthcare, doesn't make that any better than the plan that Empire sells or Aetna sells or Cigna sells, <laughs> they're all the same. What matters, and this is why you have to do it for yourself, is you have to look at the plan. Actually, the New York State Department of Financial Services has a very useful website, which includes a workbook. And you, you might want to take advantage of that. Don't jump to anybody. Anybody who says, we have the perfect plan for you, is lying. 
nobody has the perfect plan for you. The perfect plan for you would have been, you know, one where the city paid for your um, your your uh, gap coverage. So it's it, you have to balance out what the plan costs every month, the premium. And that can range from about 150 to about $400, depending how good the coverage is. And you balance that out against how much do you expect to be spending. It's a tough, it's a really requires you to spend a lot of time. It's even worth worse than doing your taxes. Oh. But it's worth worth the effort because you don't want to end if you end up doing this and and waiving out of city coverage, what you want to do is get the plan that best suits your needs. And just one further thought is um, the people at the Medicare Rights Center are um, trained to help you walk through this process. Um, and so I'd urge you, you know, I'm, I'm afraid they're going to get overwhelmed with city retirees, but urge you guys to, to call them if you have any questions at all about how any of this works. They have, they're they not getting a broker's fee from anybody. They're not selling insurance to anybody. They're a nonprofit um, operation that's there to assist us. Okay, thank you, Barbara. I, I, I think if I remember Barbara Becker's question or one of her questions, the answer the the PSC is nor the welfare fund is not going to be negotiating to find a plan to replace senior care. I think what the the, the tough news is that Barbara's reminding us of is that we have to do that ourselves. We can give you as much information about how you can go about making that choice. This is not, as you know, this is not a PSC plan and we are not in the insurance business, even though we are having to deal with all this. It's not, I, I wish, I wish that we're not the case that there's just something that we could plug in to replace what we have now, but it, it, you're going to have to do that work yourself. And I have to do it myself too, Robert Cowan. Right. But just there is like a, we saw earlier, there is really good information on the retiree health care page that provides guidance in terms of how to do that research, how to get that information. And the Medicare Rights Center is particularly helpful, I think, um, and very accessible in terms of answering uh, folks' questions and providing information about Medicare. Thank you, Dean. Robert, can you hear me? Yes, Robert, I can. Um, Dean, I was very encouraged by your statement that the PSC is continuing to fight <clears throat> to preserve our senior care. <clears throat> but I think that the PSC should step up its game a little bit. And I have three suggestions, which I hope you'll consider. One is that the PSC should financially support the lawsuit for the New York City Organization of Public Service Retirees, Marianne Pizzatola's organization. I think this would be nice to do politically also to say that we're in uh, with money to support this lawsuit. The second suggestion, is I was very disturbed by Council Speaker Adrian Adams refusing to put on the docket uh, a bill to preserve senior care. I think this is wholly undemocratic, and I hope the PSC will publicly condemn this action by her. The third proposal is uh, the PSC's proposal that a, uh, a committee of stakeholders be preserved, be, be uh, instituted to consider ways to save the city money without abandoning senior care. I think this should be put in a proposal to the city council. These are mild proposals, I think, and I hope that the PSC will consider uh, acting on them. Thank you, Robert. Dean, do you wanna take that? Sure. Um, so I, it, 
we talked at the last meeting uh, about the fact that the um, retirees haven't filed a lawsuit yet. From our conversation with their attorneys, we um, they actually don't know yet what the, the grounds for their lawsuit will be. Um, and so once they have figured that out, we can have conversations with them in terms of how that will uh, impact uh, our strategy and work with our strategy. We, you know, are part of a coalition um, and every partner in the coalition does different things and plays different roles. And that's no different from any other coalition. And I think it's completely appropriate. Um, uh, yeah, we, uh, again, in terms of um, uh, legislation to preserve city paid Medigap, which is what the senior care was, um, we do have um, ideas about that and um, are looking forward to working with um, allies in the council to try to get that done. Um, and yeah, our, we have uh, communicated, communicated to uh, members of the council our proposal to um, set up a stakeholder commission to come up with ways to address escalating healthcare costs without eliminating uh, city paid Medigap coverage. Um, and uh, that continues to be our position. So thanks for those suggestions, Robert. Thank, thank you. Uh, George Weipert. Unmute, please, George. I unmuted. Okay, good. <laughs> Many people have tried to mute me. <laughs> oh, no, 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 you've got the floor right now. I live in California. That's uh, okay. <laughs> it's you great. won't hold that against you. No. Yeah. <laughs> but I feel isolated, far away, you know, in terms of this. Uh, so I have to contact the California what? to find out information about what they'll pay, what they'll do. Um, they, if you Google, <laughs> um, if you Google California Medigap, they'll get you to the right, it's the, it's the equivalent of the Department of Financial Services or the Insurance Department. I don't know the name of it in California, but just, no just Google California Medigap and it'll connect you to the right place. Okay. Bar Barbara, would uh, the Medicare Rights Center be able to help George with that? Your pardon? I, I was writing down and not listening. Oh, I was just asking Barbara if she thought the Medicare Rights Center would be able to help you find that information. Yeah, I'm sure they could, um, but I don't think it's hard to find it. But if you run into a problem, George, call them. So, so the so the that they'll let me know how much it's going to cost me. They'll yes. So, Okay. They'll tell you what plans are available and who's selling them and what they're charging. And uh, I've heard I heard the word levels of care. So under Aetna, there are levels of care where you pay you can pay more. No, it's one no. fee. No, no. Aetna has one plan, yeah. and it's a, a a PPO. It has a network, a very large network, not quite as large as they claim. I mean, they claim that they have 1.2 million providers. There are less than 900,000 doctors in the U.S., so I don't know how they get to 1.2 million. I think they count everybody at every office, but um, it's a very large network. It's a very large plan. Um, it's but but it but. But, and it's one plan for everybody all over the country. Right. Because, because the, uh, the, 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 the uh, benefits plan uh, for eyeglasses that the union has, that, that's they, 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 don't, they don't have any offices in uh, San Francisco, <laughs> for example. Oh. So, that, so that was one of the reasons that I thought of that. So, oh. uh, so it seems to me the option, so, what, so uh, if I decide to stay in Medigap, uh, uh, I'm going to have to arrange to pay the other twenty percent. Um, yeah, you know, if you decide to stay in Medicare, not Medigap, Medicare, regular traditional Medicare, Medicare I, has Medicare has gaps, which is why it's called Medigap. It doesn't pay twenty percent of doctors' fees. It has a two thousand dollar deductible if you go in the hospital. There are a variety of ways that Medicare has gaps. 
you buy Medigap insurance to fill those holes. Yeah, okay, that's fine. So, uh, okay, and George, that's running, that's running higher than the uh, uh, probably PPO program. George, um, I'm sorry, I know you have a lot of questions and but just because you live in California doesn't mean you cannot go to the website, the retirees website, and I think will help you, if not answer your questions, lead you to a process that will help you to get answers to those questions. It's 235, there are lots of hands up. I want to know from Dean and Barbara what your time constraints are. Three o'clock, I have to go. Three o'clock, okay. Well, that's okay. Nancy Oli, one minute, please. Hi, uh, my question is about timing. Um, my understanding is that on September 1st, if I waive my uh, city coverage, I lose it. I lose the senior care, but apparently I can't uh, apply for a transfer to a Medi another Medigap plan until November 1st, and it wouldn't become operative until January 2024. If that's correct, what do I do between September and January for health care? That's not correct. Uh, Barbara? Yeah, that's not correct. Um, you can um, apply for Medigap coverage as long as you do it 30 days before September 1st. That begins on September 1st. Okay. And your Medicare will become operative again if you waive out of city coverage on September 1st. Thank you. All right. While I'm asking Erwin, Elowitz, uh, Erwin Yellowitz to uh, unmute, please. Uh, hey, here okay. I am. Okay. Uh, this question has to do with the uh, Medigap situation for people outside of New York State, because I think in New York State, uh, the uh, Medigap can, uh, companies cannot sell Medigap with medical underwriting. Outside of New York State, that's not the case, except in a few other states. And so uh, when people think about their choice, it seems to me that it's very important to understand that if they go to buy a Medigap policy, they may have to go through medical underwriting, which is going to assess their medical condition. The company may turn them down and not even sell them a policy, but if it does sell a policy, it may be at a very high cost. So I'm wondering uh, whether that is a correct, and if so, that, uh, should people who are outside of New York State uh, take very special care before they waive their, uh, their Aetna coverage? Um, Erwin, it's most, what you said is mostly right. What isn't true is in most states, there's not underwriting, there's a delay. There's a, typically there's a six month delay for pre-existing conditions, but there's no un medical underwriting. So after you sit out that six months, you have the coverage. I agree with you, though, that anybody who doesn't live in New York or, or uh, Maryland, the four states that have no uh, uh, underwriting requirements um, should carefully consider whether they it's you end up with the liability. Your Medicare goes into effect the day you opt out, the effective date that you opt out of the uh, Medicare Advance plan. What you need, though, is some protection against those gaps in Medicare. And for that, in many states, you have to wait six months. Oh, OK, Audrey Cohen. I went to the Aetna C-O-N-Y uh, website to look up physicians. And I found a physician who told me just recently that he doesn't take Medicare. So I wondered whether this website is saying people are in their network because they're in their general Aetna, general overall Aetna network, which may, excuse me, which may have nothing to do with the Medicare. And have you, has anybody else? experience that issue with the website you know um, just because network doesn't mean they're in this particular group plan if they're if they're listed in the uh, CONY Aetna plan they were 
they don't not in the, they could have dropped out, but they were in the Aetna Medicare Advantage plan. They don't just whole bring everybody in from their other networks, but somebody could have dropped out and it takes time for that to work its way through the system. So you're always, I mean, you're always best to call your doctor's office and say, are you still in the net and at the plan? Um, Thank you, Barbara. Okay, uh, Renata Bridenthal, unmute please. Yes, thank you. I have two questions. One has to do with claims. Um, the word database was brought up earlier. I wonder if there is a database for the way Aetna, the de degree to which Aetna uh, honors claims or accepts claims and pays for claims. That's one question. And related to the what, one reason it came up for me is I heard that a Medicare Advantage contract with Cigna which is not Aetna, but you know that Cigna, in fact, doesn't not only not use doctors or even bureaucrats, but algorithms to uh, to process claims. So one question is to claims, and the other one is maybe I don't understand the language right. Um, I was told by a registered nurse that it's really important to have a plan that includes hospice. Is that the word that is that what is meant when the word continuing care comes up? No. no. So how no. can we tell? How can we tell? Uh, hospice there... is a Medicare right. Is a you have a hosp You have a right to med to hospice care if you're uh, eligible for Medicare. And hospice is not part of the Medicare Advantage plan. So um, if you are um, if you are in need of hospice, um, what happens is you get bumped right back into the. Um, Medicare, straight Medicare, and Medicare hospice benefit doesn't have the gaps that regular Medicare has. So thank it's you. not it's not a benefit that's covered by the Medicare Advantage plan. Well, thank you. That's really important because you know we are of the age, and who knows, right? And so to the question of thank you. That, oh, you 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 didn't finish, Renata. I'm sorry. Can can. People start putting questions in the chat because we're not going to be able to call on everybody. And now I'm going to call on Elise Newman. Thank you. Um, I have two questions that were actually in the chat that were my questions. One of them is about the Social Security uh, deduction that's taken for Medicare every month, does that continue even if we're in the Medicare Advantage plan? And two is um, I think that one of the important things is to get the active employees involved in this issue. And I would be happy and willing to do organizing work, whatever it takes to try to reach out to those who are still working to pay attention to this issue. So just wondering if there's any effort going on within PSC to do that. Yes, there is. Can can you let us know how we can help is, is really the question. Yes, so on the second question, um, there is a working group actually of the delegate assembly that has started to meet and is talking about um, various strategies and tactics to in, get actives uh, more involved in the healthcare fight. Um, and so, yeah, you will, I don't have a, a uh, fleshed out plan for you folks today, but you will be hearing more from us on that. Um, the first question, I'm gonna defer to Barbara Caress. I have a feeling I know the answer, but- Go go uh, right ahead, Dean. I assume that, yes, they're gonna continue taking the uh, social security dedu deduction for Medicare even. Yeah, the, yeah, the Part B deduction, which is um, the one of the problems with opting, waiving city coverage is you lose your re the city reimbursement. Part B, What's taken out of Social Security is the Part P premium, and that will continue to be taken out. And uh, Bonnie, can you take down Elise's uh, Elise Newman's name so we can follow up with that? That she wants to work with in service members. I did. Okay, great. Step ahead of me, Henry Lesnick. Unmute, please, Henry. Hi. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
I have a, a, a question, somewhat detailed. Can our retiree group draft a basic informational letter to retiree groups of all municipal unions asking them to show their group support for the option to keep our earned Medicare coverage. Have copies of this statement with signatories delivered to the mayor and the New York City Council members. And we've actually have several of these, at least two uh, drafts of such a letter uh, been produced, but we await approval of the group and leadership of the group before proceeding. End of, end of question. It seems to me that we want to be in solidarity with yes. as many groups, retirees as possible. And I also endorse Bob Cowan's suggestion that we um, make a contribution to the New York City group and the uh, core group, both of which are doing Herculean work. Thank you. Thank right. you, Henry. Um, so we have an act, uh, act Now letter um, that uh, does demand um, that New York City uh, preserve um, city paid uh, Medigap is a supplement to traditional Medicare, and that has been shared with the other retiree organizations. Okay, um, uh, Valerie Krishna, uh, unmute, please. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, uh, if we opt out or waive our city coverage, does it change our relationship with Medicare in any way? In other words, do we keep the same card with the same number? No. So, oh, Barbara, am I correct? Your Medicare number is your Medicare number, and it lives with you for the rest of your life. The only time it's not applicable is when you are in a Medicare Advantage plan. So if, if you go into the Medicare Advantage plan and then you say, I don't like this, I'm going to wave out, you revert back to the same number. But don't, uh, aren't we expecting, if we do not waive uh, the Aetna choice, that we will be getting new, new cards? No, your Medicare card is your Medicare card. It doesn't change. What you won't have is the uh, Blue Cross and Emblem supplemental cards. But your Medicare card remain, will remain uh, effective. All right, Bruce, I'm sorry, I'm gonna skip over you because we have a lot of hands up. Ann Bard. And while Ann's unmuting- You're skipping Barbara, me? Well, I'm skipping you because you already had a question and uh, there are like 10 other people in line, I can come back to you, depending on if Barbara caress, I don't know how long Barbara can stay. Uh, we're getting close to 10 of three. Barbara? Um, I could stay a few minutes after three, but not much. Okay, then um, Bruce, uh, I'll come back to you or please put your question in the chat. Ann Bard. Uh, yes, I did put this in the chat. I'm just concerned there's no, not much publicity about what's happening to all the city retirees. I wondered if someone at PSC CUNY is working on getting it into the New York Times. Um, we've done a, quite a bit of press work, uh, and there have been a number of good press pieces. I think some of them are on the retiree healthcare page. Um, New York Times has um, not covered it, uh, oddly. I mean, they're covering the Medicare issues at the national level, um, and they did a really good investigative piece a couple months back, um, but they have not covered uh, the New York City issue. Um, but the Daily News um, uh, really, uh, maybe somewhat surprisingly, has actually had very good coverage, and 
they've run a number of pieces and a couple of op-eds that we've helped place. Okay, thank you. And there's also um, city and state is doing good coverage uh, and uh, Gothamist uh, is doing good coverage. And then um, there's a smaller uh, blog called Work Bites that actually is doing very good coverage. Thank you, Dean. Um, Joel Schwartz, please. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, fine. Uh, it, it took quite a, a few registering for this meeting. I only joined about a half hour ago, or you only admitted me a, about a half hour ago. I, something is wrong. All right, we apologize. And it, 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 it gets, and it, it, it adds to my feeling of, of almost total abandonment. Uh, we need a, a, a staff of lawyers, each individual, uh, and individual needs a staff of lawyers to kind of navigate their way around. I, I live in Massachusetts after my whole life uh, time in, in New York State. And uh, uh, so I don't, it, I'm, I'm, I'm uneasy about um, the different uh, uh, aspects of the coverage and so forth. And the more I investigate, the more confusing it is. Uh, one question I have though, and I, I used to be able to call uh, the wealth the PSC welfare fund office and so forth and get some questions answered. There is very little now. Uh, we're worse off, my observation is we're worse off than we were two years ago. Uh, and I really have to sort through this stuff we're being blackmailed into and basically forced into this uh, inadequate uh, program that's heavily advertised, I might say. Uh, but my question is, I poured a lot of money in terms of premiums into the, um, New York State, um, uh, whatever it is, it's the uh, MRSA, catastrophic insurance. And at the end of the last meeting, uh, it seemed someone implied that we'd lose that if we, I, I hate to say opted, I'm really opting into uh, my constitutional right to, uh, to continue to have Medicare. Uh, it's being taken away from us. Uh, under circumstances that we really have very little control. And I don't want to make this as a criticism, but um, I, I feel kind of almost abandoned. And uh, yes, I'm willing to do the groundwork and I've done a lot of, of stuff before, but um, I'm really at a loss to what's going on. And, and the more I investigate, the more, it seems that the union or even the retirees chapter is sort of, well, you know, it's not bad. Can you wrap up, Joel? All right. Yeah, all right. So my question is, um, in a reaction to what I've raised, and also, uh, do I lose if I uh, continue to uh, want, pre want to preserve Medicare? Do I lose my catastrophic insurance, which I've paid in a considerable amount of money over the years already? I believe the catastrophic is a separate item. Am I correct, Barbara? Yes. Yes. You pay for that now. You will continue to pay for it. I'm sorry for your frustration. I totally, I mean, I, I totally understand it. We're all really frustrated. And uh, if you're not getting answers to your phone calls, please put that in the chat. If you're not getting answers, I'm not sure with the welfare fund or whatever. Ava, I have a question for you before we move on. Who is George? Oh, after George. Oh, God. All right. Um, sorry. I'm trying to judge how much more time we have, which is about 15 minutes max. Arlene Bronzoft. Uh, can you unmute, Arlene? I'm muting it. May I just, do you hear me? Yes, we yeah. do. Okay. This is the one thing that keeps confusing me. I do not plan to go on to the new one. I'm going to stay with Medicare and get a Medigap. Does that mean the PSC CUNY welfare drug plan is lost? That the PSC CUNY welfare drug plan only goes if you switch to the advantage. That keeps coming up and it's not clear. So yeah, I right. want to know the status of the drug plan because I do get drugs and it's an excellent plan. 
what happens when I go to Medigap? Do I need to get a new drug plan? I'd like clarity on that. It just never comes through clear. Right, thank I, you. I think so, let, me, let me try again on that. Um, the reason you don't have total clarity is because we are still negotiating with CUNY on that. So we are encouraging folks to, again, not uh, jump right into making your decision about um, whether or not to waive. Um, right now, as I said um, at the beginning, CUNY is taking the position that they will um, temporarily continue to contribute to the welfare fund on behalf of people who decide to uh, wave out of New York City health coverage. And we are fighting to force them to continue contributing to the welfare fund um, on behalf of those folks. So there isn't a clear answer yet. We're still fighting. Um, and I would say that, uh, you know, we, we are fighting hard and we are very confident, um, but uh, as in any fight over uh, a contract provision, there's no way to say with 100% certainty what the outcome is gonna be until we actually get to an agreement. Um, so, so the advice is to wait if possible, right? The right. advice is to wait. Um, Barbara Court. Yes, Barbara. Barbara. I'm gonna call on Mary Kane and we can come back to Barbara Court. Mary Kane, can you unmute? Yes, yes, yes. can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, my question is somewhat similar to the previous one. If, um, if one stays with the PSC welfare benefits, which I would like to do, um, are your medications still covered in Medicare Part D? Because I'm on a very expensive medication. I think for specific questions like that, you, you're going to have to ch check with the welfare fund. I mean, Dean, am I right here? We don't, yeah. we can't answer questions about specific medications. Right, um, and I would say um, the, the best way to get your question answered by the welfare fund should be to um, send an email to Michael Foley, who's Michael the Foley. communications director, yeah. Yeah, M Foley, M F O L E Y. Yes. Okay. Is is Barbara Court there? Hello, Barbara. All right. It says Barry Smith, but I see a woman's face. Barry Smith. Yes. Yes, that's us. That's my that's wife. Barry. Okay. 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 So, just to get some this very straight. My husband and I attended three CUNY meetings about how to retire at $60 each meeting, 30 for each of us. And we learned all about the benefits and now none of this applies. So I want to make sure that I have this straight. If we continue on the benefit that was promised to us, we lose the Medicare and IRMA reimbursement, we lose the welfare fund benefits, maybe. We have to pay for our own Medigap and find it. And on the TIAA issue of our annuity that we've already bought for our medical care, nobody knows the answer to. And yet we are expected to make a decision by the end of June. So my question is, do we have any good lawyers here? Because I don't even understand how after attending three meetings and doing everything right, I've, I have this list in front of me. Only one thing is certain that we're gonna lose the one benefit we were supposed to have. The other three are all maybes and we have till the end of June. Is there a lawyer doing anything about this? How can this even be legal? Well, there's a lawyer in the house. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, I'm a lawyer. I'm not sure uh, how good of one I am. Like, uh, uh, actually, I think I'm a very good lawyer. That's although that's not my job here. That's not your um, job here. Um, but 
yeah, it's terrible what the city's doing. We have fought it all the way. Um, now uh, we're continuing to fight it, but at the same time, we have to um, get these questions answered uh, about what happens, you know, if this becomes a reality, which is looking increasingly like it will. And we are doing the best we can to respond and adapt as these changes are happening, as all of you are. Um, and uh, so, you know, that's the, the, the best I can do. Unfortunately, I wish I could supply certainty to everybody. I know um, people would be a lot less anxious if I could. I'd be a lot less anxious if I could. Um, but we're giving you honestly the information that we have as we get it, and we are continuing to fight and advocate in the interest of retirees, and we um, will continue to provide uh, accurate information as we get it. Thank you, Dean. All right, I'm going to call on John Hyland and then Emil Chi, or, and, and the rest of you, if you have your hands up, please put your questions in the chat. Debbie and Barbara go through the chat. <laughs> John Highland. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you, everybody, for the all the information. Um, I have a question regarding the 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 level of this. That this is not just the New York City problem. This is this will affect the state and and the national. We, we're hearing the people who are active in this are hearing that this is happening in other states and other unions across the country. How do we connect our uh, position on this to those other levels? It's gonna affect the teachers on Long Island, upstate, so that involves NYSEN. It's gonna affect, as I said, it's already beginning to affect other unions across the country. That then entails AFT. How do we connect these various levels of this um, fight? Yeah, John, that's a great question. That's also come up at previous meetings. And um, it is uh, an issue that um, our leadership has raised and discussed both with NYSIT and with the AFT. Um, and um, uh, we're part of other uh, coalitions um, uh, fighting around healthcare issues and fighting for a single payer healthcare. And um, we do have to be active at all those levels, uh, at the state level and, and at the federal level, as well as New York City, because New York City by itself, although there's a ton of work left for us to do here, um, can't address the national healthcare crisis by itself. So you're quite right, John, to say that um, this is an effort that uh, really requires both state and national uh, action. And, um, you know, we, we're doing that work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean. Okay, the last question is going to be Emil Chi or Chai. I'm sorry, I don't know the correct pron pronunciation. The rest of you, please put your questions in the chat. Emil? Hi, it's pronounced Chi, and thank you for asking. Um, I, I have a two-part question. I, I am bi-coastal. I live half the year in California and half in New York City. I have truly excellent physicians that I see in both cities. I do not want to change my doctors at all. At the beginning of this whole switch to this Medicare disadvantage plan, which is what I call it, um, there was a lot of noise that we would be able to see our own doctors. I would like to know if that's true and if we can still go to the hospital of our choice. Barbara? I Emil, think. that's the toughest question. If your doctors and the hospitals are in network, the chances are it's pretty they good. They are not. They are they not. Are not. They're, they're, they're not. too good to be in. They're too good no, to be in the I, lousy I, that's, in network. That's not, Emil, that's not fair. fair. Well, that really isn't well, fair. There are there are hundreds of thousands of very excellent doctors who accept okay. Medicare okay. Advantage. So I'm- But mine don't, I know I, that. I, well, okay, they don't. Then you will ask them if they are willing to accept the PPO payment. 
And the reason why some people will say no, because the PPO payment is exactly the same as what they would have gotten from Medicare at 100% rather than 80%. But many doctors, not the majority, but many doctors say, I do not want to be in a Medicare Advantage plan because I don't want to risk a denial. I don't want to do the paperwork. I don't want to risk a denial. And the fact of the matter is, is that they do far too many denials. And the reason we know that is because on appeal, almost all of them are reversed. However, it's a tremendous burden for a, for a doctor's office to go through the process of getting, if they're out of network, of getting um, approval, uh, appealing a denial. You may have to appeal it a second time. And they bank on you not doing that. Thank you, Barbara. Okay, that's going to be our last question for today. If uh, you haven't already done so, put your question in the chat. Our next scheduled meeting is June the 5th. And we scheduled that meeting specially to talk more about this crisis. In the interim, please go to the website I, I know everybody is really, really nervous. And sometimes when we're really nervous, you know, we hear things once, we hear it twice, we don't write it down, we forget. Some of the questions, the same questions are coming up as I glance at the chat. I can't, you know, I can't uh, read all those questions. Please go to the website, read it thoroughly. Click on the links, read it thoroughly. If you can't get an answer, I hate to say this, but you're gonna have to call Aetna and do the best you can with Aetna. If you're getting the runaround from Aetna, that's when you write to us so that we can keep track of all of these problems. The Office of Labor Relations at CUNY is the one is has been pushing this plan and made a decision with the mayor to keep this plan. That's who's responsible. And uh, some people are asking about unions. We have friendly unions. We have unions that are not so friendly. James Davis works relentlessly trying to pull together any union uh, uh, sister union colleagues who will work with us. It's a terrible situation. We're all anxious, frustrated. I hope you feel that the union and the chapter, we're doing the best, the best that we possibly can. And I can't, you know, thank you all enough for your patience and your advocacy, let's not forget, we fought this, we fought this, we fought this, we fought this. And if you forgot what we did fighting it, you can find that history on the uh, retiree website at all. We did not get here without a fight and the fight is not over. Please try to educate yourselves as much as you possibly can and we will be in touch and we will continue to do as a union, as your union, whatever we can. So thank you very much, Dean. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, everybody. And go forth and do the best. <laughs> We're all dancing as fast as we can. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day and a good week.